grab your pre-workout and turn up that volume. It is time for a new episode of the Powerlifters Den with your host, Cam Smith. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Powerlifters Den. I'm your host, Cam Smith. And today I wanted to bring on Nick Benarakis, also known as Big Benches. Uh, Nick, why don't you introduce yourself? I appreciate you having me on. Um, yeah, I go by Coach Ben. Uh, most people call me Ben. The fact that my name is Nick throws a lot of people off. Um, but yeah, no, I'm a, a powerlifting coach. Been doing it, been competing and coaching for nearly a decade now, over a decade. Um, so been in the game a little bit here and have a vast history with equipped, raw, um, you name it, coaching lifters. So I'm excited to be on here. Thanks for having me on. Of course. Um, so to get started, I like to kind of get a background, kind of what got someone into powerlifting. So for you, what kind of sparked your initial interest in powerlifting and kind of what kind of slowly turned you into, I guess, a bench specialist? Yeah. So uh, initially getting into powerlifting, well, I was always pretty active when I was younger because we had a gym in our basement. So I would go down there and live with my dad. Um, he always says it's funny that I'm doing the things I do now because I did not want to be down there. Uh, it was a cold basement. And uh, yeah, it was like pulling teeth to get me to go down there to lift. But, um, you know, so I, I had a head start because I would do that when I was younger. Uh, when I was in high school, I played baseball. And at my final year, my senior year, I uh, got very active my senior year in the gym at school, um, trying to figure out like what was I going to do after school as well, like in college, what was going to be my path. Um, so at that time, we would, a gym class, we would go to the the weight room. We had a uh, gym teacher who, he was awesome because it wasn't just like dodgeball every day, which is fine by me too. But I mean, he got us in the weight room and uh, I was the strongest kid in the class by far. So everyone started looking up to me as like the leader of that, that class, showing them what to do, showing them how to bench. Um, and I was like, wow, this feels, this is cool. This is awesome. I was going through a body transformation at that time myself. So I was so active. I was a pretty overweight kid and I was leaning out really nice. Um, and so I made the decision that year too, I was going to go and do kinesiology in, uh, in college exercise science. So I was going to go that route. Um, and, you know, I still didn't get into powerlifting, competing in powerlifting during that time just yet. I think it was maybe my sophomore or junior year. Um, but I was getting more serious about lifting, and I was reading a lot of uh, – funny, I was actually – I worked at Barnes & Noble for some time. So I would always pick up the Flex magazines and um, I think Arnold's Encyclopedia is what gets us all into it. But I would read that, and – I was into the bodybuilding stuff, realized, you know, I don't really grow for shit. So I was, I think I'll just lift heavy weights, try my hand at that. Uh, and then, you know, I found a random meet up in Buffalo and that was my first meet, I think 2013, somewhere around then. And I guess long story short, that's how I got into it. Yeah. And then for, I guess, maybe for bench press, bench press specifically, um, do you have like kind of like a defining moment that made you focus on that so heavily? Um, yeah, defining moment. I'm not sure if it was kind of just slowly that I realized, Hey, I think I'm, I'm pretty good at benching. And then when I realized how damn short my arms actually are, I was like, I got to take this further. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, so when I, I went out, I, I, um, my first exposure to coaching powerlifting, being around other groups of powerlifters was when I interned. Uh, during that college period, I actually came out to Long Island, interned at Gaglion Strength. And um, when I was involved with that crew, yeah, it's a bench. Um, I saw equipped lifters and, man, I was just really uh, interested in equipped lifting and bench press in general. And I remember the first time I came out, there was a Donnie Thompson seminar. And uh, just, it was, it was funny seeing Donnie set up on the bench. He's just this big dude, short bench stroke. He was telling us how to maximize our leverages and how to keep that short stroke in the bench. And being around equipped lifters, I was just like, this is going to be my thing. This is going to be my thing. So I guess it just evolved in time. But Yeah. Uh, when was the first time you got into a shirt? Uh, it was, so I spent that summer being around everyone. Um you know, Don Manici and Sandy Tepper and, and John. There was a lot of equipped lifters in the gym. 
And uh, so it was always on the back of my mind. I was like, this is really cool. It's really weird. Um, I don't know how you start getting into it kind of thing. But I was like, yeah, I, I want to try doing this. Um, so I remember after that internship, went back home. And there was a meet. It was a RPS New England Revolution. I want to say 2014 maybe. And uh, Vinny DeZenzo was his last time benching. And uh, he did 900 that day. And I remember being in the back room because I did that meet. I was just doing some raw full power. And uh, I saw him moving. must have been 800, 900, even maybe off boards in the back. And I was like, holy shit, this is wild. This is awesome. Uh, so I went and at some point thereafter, I ordered up a Inzer Phenom. Uh, just single ply and uh, I remember getting it in I put it on and I'm like damn I think I ordered the wrong size (laughs) I had no clue we had the breaking process and the whole nine but I was like damn I ordered the wrong size but it was a bit of a learning curve trying to figure it out myself but that was the first time it was probably 2014 it was very early on I was only competing for maybe a couple years at that point but yeah and for me it was kind of even when I first started powerlifting, I kind of knew, and I was like, I, I knew what equipped was, and I kind of was like, eh, I don't think I'll ever be near it that much, or, like, uh, a lot of people at Mass Iron weren't really doing it then, there was a couple people here and there, and um, I wasn't training there, like, full-time, I was still going to, like, the local Y, and then when I kind of started diving into it more, being around, like, Evolve and stuff, I was like, all right, we're going to give this a go, so I, I have, like, a, a clapped out, like, SDP that I've been rocking with, um <laughs> yeah. and the, the first time i put on a poly shirt it was like some old metal shirt or whatever and it was it was pretty easy to use for the first time just because it was so loose and then um kind of learning that you're actually supposed to wear the shirt really tight and me still struggling with like the clapped out shirt i'm like all right we this is going to take some time to to, to learn because i mean i've probably only been in my sdp about 10 times so i was lucky enough to be able to scrape together a meet but um it's definitely one of those things that the more time you put in literally the more you get out of it. Yeah. Why'd you gravitate to equip lifting? Just the, first of all, the multiply community is unmatched. Um, just the support system. And I mean, we all join powerlifting to be able to move weight. So having tools to allow you to move more weight and just kind of like the, the high octane level of lifting as well as the, the skill. Um, something I actually said the other day, I was like, Multiply powerlifting is kind of like the golf of powerlifting where it takes a lot more skill than it necessarily does strength. But obviously, if you have a good space, it's going to get you further. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I enjoy watching it a lot more, too. Yeah. There's nothing like watching equipped lifting versus raw lifting. So raw lifting is over so quick. Equipped lifting, it's like it, it, it could go south real quick. It's yeah, I, exactly. It's like kind of like the F1 and stuff where it's like, yeah, yeah the get to move more weight and it's kind of the equipment is helping but there's a lot more risk it's a lot more skill and it's not easier raw is easy but it's not easier to get strong at absolutely 100 percent. so um your best bench was 820 in multiply um maybe tell us a little about over the years kind of sometimes where you were struggling the shirt maybe you kind of figured a couple things out to give you like a, a big boost yeah, so um, as I was progressing through, I started single ply. So I did that for for a while. Um, then I was like, all right, well, how can we keep benching more? I don't know, let's add some more layers, I guess. So started messing with multiply. First multiply meet, did 600. Uh, and then just kept building from there. Uh, packed on a lot of weight at one point. There was a point in time where I added maybe 30 pounds in a couple months. I was literally having these shakes as well where I'll tell you, I would would pack this shake that I would drink every day. It was like a mass gainer. It was, uh, I threw nuts in it, bananas. I mean, you name it, oats, literally everything. And I would drink it right before bed sometimes. Um, And it had had like 2,500 calories plus in the thing. And there were some nights I would just, I would be up and my heart would be going. Thum, 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 thum. And I was like, I think tonight's the night I'm going to die. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, obviously 
that was a great boost because um, you know mass moves mass if you're bigger not, i grew with my shirt i had a inzer sdp i bought used off some dude in texas shipped it up uh it was triple in the arms i want to say or triple in the chest double in the arms and i just grew with that thing i wore it out for meets at 198 to meets the 275 um and it would just expand with me so um yeah i just kept adding year in year out did uh had some great opportunities to do uh, the last man standing thing on uh on the uh, the rogue stage at the arnold uh had an opportunity to do that 2017 when it was still just a three lift meet did 700 at that point but talking about uh facing some adversity and having to figure things out uh, there were certainly time, I think just figuring out what was the right structure to my training, like frequency I had to be in this shirt, because like you mentioned, uh, it's definitely a blend between strength and skill. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot more skill involvement with equip lifting. So when you're lifting this amount of weight too, I could beat you up. So I would get some real gnarly, just shoulder elbow pain to the point where like your arms going numb as your bench and, uh, you know, the deal. So it's uh it's trying to figure it out you know how often do i have to be in the shirt in order to be proficient at it mm -hmm. um and just coming up with the right concoction of training that's gonna get you where you want to go and allow you to actually compete and not be so beat up but i guess that would be one of the main adversities is just overcoming things like that for sure and i think this is kind of a good little segue to kind of dive into what you do on a daily basis and um your kind of brand. So maybe tell us a little bit about your brand and kind of where, where you came up with the idea and when it kind of started to take off. Yeah, sure. So, um, I always wanted to just get started in, in coaching, doing my own thing. Uh, I have my own brand and that started back in 2016 is when I made the big benches account. <laughs> And so, you know, I spent a lot of time just thinking, all right, well, if I'm going to come up with some kind of coaching brand, what the hell am I going to name it? Uh, and I didn't want to just do the, the normal, like your last name, strength, fitness, whatever. Um, I want some kind of unique. So I'm like, well, bench is my thing. And that's what I want to be known for. That's I sometimes will do bench only meets in specific. So I was like, well, I, I can't do big benchers because I mean that you're not going to get that URL or, <laughs> you know, you're not going to get that on Instagram. So I was like, well, I, everyone in New York always talks about me having some kind of a Boston accent, Massachusetts accent. Yep. So I'm like, oh, I'll just do be big benches and yeah. that's <laughs> enough to switch it up. So I created that. It was a Facebook page. I made the Instagram, made a website. Uh, and man, starting out, I would I'd coach people practically free and um, just kind of grew from there. And that was eight years ago now. But yeah, that's kind of where that started 2016 it was in january and just been uh putting out content mostly pertaining to bench ever since mm -hmm. haven't really missed the beat i think the biggest thing is just being consistent so people know you're there and you're historically going to be there and you know that the rest just kind of builds itself yeah and so for as far as like the your clientele um obviously with bench being your forte i'm assuming you have a, a few guys that are bench only but um i know Obviously, every coach needs to coach gen pop, other populations, things like that, and full powerlifters. Um, I guess maybe if you were to put like a, a percentage wise of what population is what, what do you have for clients? Uh, I tell you, I really have a mixed bag, I would say. Um, there are some bench focused lifters, but I have vast majority full power lifters, I have equipped lifters. I have raw lifters, I have female lifters, I have men. Um, it's honestly, it's a grab bag, even where they compete. Yeah. Yeah, I'll compete in USAPL myself at the moment. So I have a lot of USAPL competitors. I have Power in America IPF competitors. I have USPA. I have just the whole multiply type gang, just RPS, W, W, um, what's the new one? APO? Yep. Yeah. So, you know, people involved with that. So I have a mixed bag it's uh, it's really cool because i enjoy all of it yeah and i think so the reason i kind of asked that was um just because someone may have like a, a especially um i think having a wide clientele of pretty much everyone every division like you said 
male, female, every federation, every type of competing they want. Um, not only does it allow the coach itself to, to grow, to learn more, to kind of get more, I guess, data to make their athletes better and kind of improve as a coach, but um, you get to kind of see different sides of the sport as well. Yeah, no, it's truly, it's been amazing. I love what I do because it isn't just niched down to one specific thing. Like people don't just come to me just for bench. Yeah. I feel like we have a lot to offer with the other lifts as well. Um, but people find me through bench, but just a lot of different federations, a lot of exposures to different things. Um, it's cool. Cause I enjoy all of it. I love, I love going to just a, a heavy, uh, multiply meet and you know the music's blasting and shocks flying you got these big dudes and all the equipment and then you go to i was just spent time at raw nationals and it's just it's much more like structured and rigid and you just you get total different sides of the coin but i love all forms of lifting and uh what what i do as a coach allows me to experience all that so yeah. truly, I'm truly blessed for for those who i can work with here yeah, and I'm glad you said that because I feel like in the, I mean, we can get into this a little bit more down the line, but um, in the, the sport of powerlifting right now, there's still that division between raw and equipped and like the federation drama and everything. And um, it's nice to hear someone that is actually in it for the sport itself and loves all sides of it. Yeah. No, I don't even know what's going on half the time. It looks like one fed's mad at another, and then there's a new one that just popped up. Or <laughs> Yeah, I know. If, honestly, if it wasn't for just knowing so many people and doing things like this, I, I wish I could just not know what's going on and just do it. But um, as with as a curious mind, it's something that I kind of always like to listen to drama, but I hate being involved in. Yeah, you know, I hate it for my lifters. Some of them, too, can't, like, seriously can't find meats around them. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, there's always the politics involved with like the people who run meets in this region, we don't really get along for this reason. And then, but there's nothing else really available. Mm -hmm. um, I wish it was just more unified. Like the lifters I coach internationally and they don't have a choice. I mean, it's, you got one option. Yeah. yeah. You got two options. It just makes it simpler. Mm -hmm. then, so I wish it was just one umbrella that you could do everything you wanted and just, <laughs> enjoy it <laughs> yeah i totally agree um so you mentioned you're, you're currently competing in usapl you are you currently raw are you doing single ply single ply yeah so, i couldn't i couldn't do raw <laughs> um i guess my question off of that would be um i kind of have a good understanding of what the raw usapl community is like um what maybe tell us a little bit about the the single ply in usapl because that's kind of it's not necessarily small but it's it's pretty niche because usapl tends to be mostly raw focused yeah, it's uh, it's very niche uh, until you get to some of the bigger level meets like Equip Nationals and things like that. Um, you know, there's there's a good little pool of people, but it's certainly it's a minority for sure. But um, you're competitive with everyone. I tell you, I've never had so much fun just coaching and lifting at meets in terms of you're always battling it out with someone and. There's so much little like jockeying for positioning that can go on. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, I need a lift. I got to calculate this so I can get ahead of someone for this dot score. It just makes it fun. It's like a totally different thing versus, you know, when I was doing multiply back in the day, it's you're going to show up and you're going to try to do your best. But yeah. there's not a ton of that jockeying for position type of thing. Um, but, yeah, no, I, I definitely couldn't lift raw. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> It's not my cup of tea after doing this for so long, but no, I think it's a really good community. I think a lot of people are moving over though, because IPF is now tied in with powerlifting America. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of great opportunity there to travel international meets and stuff, but I, I really love what USAPL is doing and they're coming up with like their own kind of international federation it looks like as well and expanding. So I like what they do from, you know, so just being a big, umbrella type organization and it being a business i think they manage your business well and they grow the sport and i just i like the flow of what's going on there yeah i definitely think they do take have some really good things in terms of their structuring um and i think that's part of why i mean like you were saying before with multiplied meets you kind of 
you show up high energy, just trying to put on the biggest total. Like it's 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 the purest form of chaos you could imagine, and, and USAPL is kind of the the I guess the opposite, and I think that's maybe why there's some like clashing between the two. But um, it is nice to watch and enjoy both for what they are. Um, but I kind of want to go back to coaching a little bit. Um, maybe for since you've been coaching, since you kind of started the brand, what's been some of the most rewarding aspects of coaching your athletes? Most rewarding aspects. Well, I always love uh, the opportunity to go and coach at meets, you know, because predominantly what I do is online. Yeah. You know, I, we literally we train tonight. I just have a little crew. We train bench tonight. Um, but other than that, you know, I'll, I'll have people come in. I'll do some one-on-one stuff. I'll go out and do bench clinic. But getting the coach lifters in person at a meet and feel the emotions they go through and be with them for that process and take them through all their training and then lead up to that day. Uh, and then, you know, having the opportunity, I always wanted to be able to travel and have a reason to travel, you know, and see all these different places. I never did that when I was younger. Mm-hmm. So to go to all these different states and literally travel the U.S. and compete and to coach – um that's probably the most rewarding thing is seeing a lifter's emotions when they nail that big lift and you're there and you're part of it that's that's the best yeah i I think going to a meet to handle an athlete is definitely the most fun because you get to not only see their work pay off but kind of your work as well you're like all right things went well you can kind of take notes of what went wrong or maybe even obviously you're not going to kind of make any form adjustments meet day because that's kind of a silly thing to do you're going to throw them off but maybe you notice something that you haven't noticed on videos and like you can get a lot of things on a meet day even with like a max effort you can be like well this is some where it's breaking down and this so this is a new weak point we need to work on there's a lot there's a lot to take from an actual meet day yeah i get to see these lifters that i I just been working with online um it feels like we have such a great connection when we meet up because our communication is so great in the online space but um, you know, when I get there, I'll take notes of what I'm seeing in person, and it's hard to replicate the feedback you get from that. But uh, yeah, it's just that's the best part is being at those big events and having those opportunities for sure. Yeah, and I guess my next question: um, this could just be on meet day or just with their general programming, their communication. But what separates some of the best athletes from the rest? I think uh, their ability. You know, I always have to have a good work ethic, have to have um, great consistency, great consistency. Uh, I'll tell you that right now. That's that's the biggest thing that jumps to mind is um, you don't just do it when you feel like doing it. You do it when shit's tough. Yep. <laughs> or you find a way around um, if injuries pop up. Because, listen, it's a long road powerlifting, you know. I mean, you got to be willing to put in the time. You're going to have bumps in the road. But, you know, if you can consistently find ways to train around whatever's happening and keep your mindset sharp, I think a lot goes into setting goals, um, creating just good habits as well. Uh, you know, what, what is going, what's it going to take for you to evolve into the type of person that's capable of achieving the things you actually want to achieve? 100%. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, here and there, you have those genetic anomalies that, they can train once a month and they'll add a hundred pounds to their total. But um, so you'd agree that mindset is almost more important than their, their physical capability in terms of powerlifting. That's where it starts. hundred percent. You know, something I always tell my athletes is, you know, especially if they're stuck at a certain number, but you, you got to believe that you're someone like when I was pushing eight hundreds, I had to believe I'm a 900 pound bencher because I had to trick my mind. So every time I would train, I'd be like, well, if I'm a 900 pound bench or working through the sevens, there's no problem. This is lightweight. Yeah. So whatever it is, affirmations, uh, visualization, you know, utilizing these tools is enormous because unless you fix what's up here in your head, then you're not going to break through no matter how good your program is or what you're focused on with your technique. You need to have it upstairs and just your daily habits have to reflect that. Yep. Um, so as a coach, how do you approach athletes who are kind of stuck in a plateau, especially if it's a, a mental block rather than physical? So something that I do within our program is, and I'll meet regularly with our, our lifters, uh, on zoom. And we'll just talk about how the flow of things going. If we want to make adjustments to training, what's going on with technique. 
Uh, but sometimes it's it's funny. I actually, I, I just kind of let the conversation take its flow, and we get down to like what's the root of what's going on. Yeah. And sometimes it's not really the technique. It's not the effort they're putting in there, the focus they're bringing to the gym. Sometimes it's not really the program either. It's there's some things wrong that leading to inconsistency, but a lot of times it's, we talk about mindset, um, you know, controlling your schedule. You know, majority of the people that I train, they're, they're not just solely doing powerlifting, you know, they're traveling for work and they're single moms or, you know, they got life stuff going on. So it's really figuring out how to control the flow of their training within their chaotic schedules. Um, so I find that, you know, those, sometimes those conversations go a totally different route than I was expecting. And then those are the things we end up talking on. And then it's by making some kind of a schedule hack or a training hack, or we change some things around that really escalates them to the next level. Yeah. And I, I think doing things like zoom and um, having that like communication where it's not just, all right, here's your program, fill out the sheet that's it or send me videos I'll, I'll check in but rather than kind of adapting to what's going on in their life outside of powerlifting to kind of keep them on that right track of discipline because we all know that motivation doesn't last and um, I definitely think that's the right way to go about things especially when you're online and you can't be in person to basically slap them upside the head and tell them to kick <laughs> it into gear <laughs> yeah online's tough um, because you know for people coming in I remember when I got started too i mean there's no rule book there on what you have to do you know like many other professions you go to school for you learn it you know the logistics of it how the things work um but when you get an online coach and i mean it's just the wild west you have an idea like you're supposed to help this person get strong but you know in terms of how you deliver the program how you uh, execute check-ins you know the types of software that you use within and there's no rule book for it. You're just, you're kind of evolving on the fly and communication's key. So that's, uh, that's the big thing. And that's where I see a lot of lifters. And, and I don't fault the online coaches. You know, I don't, I don't fault them because maybe they just don't know. Yeah. They don't know what else people are doing, but um, I certainly don't fault them. I think everyone is good natured and wanting to help people. I think the execution just goes very awry. And it's very easy to just kind of sit back and be like, think like, Hey, I did my job. Yeah. I the program? And I think that's because there's kind of so much information out there. There's so many different ways to go about things, whether like you said, even if it's just from how you program it on your, like whatever software you use to what type of programming to how you're communicating there, there's so much room for creativity to kind of make yourself unique that it can almost be, overwhelming to where the point it's you kind of get lost in the in the market and even though there is that unique and creativity aspect of it it's such a saturated market and to kind of um get those people in into your community um i, I wonder i wanted to know how you kind of keep that community you have so motivated and engaged uh so we're really big on team community uh in terms of just doing things together as a collective, we're really big on celebrating wins. So, you know, if I see someone hit a PR and they just message me directly or something like that, then I'll be like, you better post this to the team group. You know, we're going to celebrate that or put it in the team chat, but I'm really big on doing things as a team. Uh, we just did like a, a belt sleeve order and you know, we'll do things for like the Arnold is a big event for us. We get a lot of our lifters together for that. Um, but I think when you have those people supporting you, I mean, you know, you train with crews, multiply crews. Imagine if you had to try to do that shit alone. No, I don't want to imagine that. <laughs> you know? It sounds horrible. So, it's nice when you're doing it with other people and they care about your success. Mm -hmm. And in terms of just keeping people motivated, I think that's a, a key element is that we're all here supporting each other. There's ways to get involved. And we've, uh, there's been teammates on, on my program that have, become like lifelong friends and it's awesome when we get together at events and i see them interacting and i'm like wow this this feels cool yeah and i think that's part of what makes powerlifting so cool too is it's i mean we all have to work a day job still for, for the most part there's not enough money in it so it, it is considered a hobby but um being able to make the lifelong friends and meet new people is something that um is often overlooked and should be 
kind of not take it for granted in the sport. Yeah, absolutely. That's something I'm most thankful for because I tell you what, um, other than being in the powerlifting circles, I am not an outgoing person whatsoever. Like you take me to some kind of work dinner or something, and I'm not talking to anyone. Like I, I don't know what to say to you. <laughs> we could talk about football maybe, but yeah, all my friends, um, you know, outside of those I grew up with, probably come from the realm of powerlifting in some respect. Yeah. So kind of move on to the the next topic. I want to kind of dive into the the specifics of the bench, maybe some like technique things and stuff. Um, it seems like from what you kind of post, uh, you post a lot of things that are like little small fixes that can make a huge difference. Um, maybe what are some of the, maybe if you had like a top three kind of adjustments to someone's bench, what, what are some of the technique things that you um, often repeat or see as common mistakes? Sure. Well, there's a lot of common mistakes. Um, I start, my process starts from the setup on. Mm -hmm. I think you truly need to first address the process of how you're setting up, the process of then unracking the bar, two things that go grossly overlooked. Agreed. Uh, and until you get those things dialed in, I don't care what the execution looks like, you know, because we need to have those things in place. So I guess the biggest things that jump out, this isn't really an issue for people who are already proficient in powerlifting, like done meets, they understand this, but usually it's, there's not sufficient traction on the benches that they're even benching on. Yeah. Like it's commercial gym benches or slick benches. I mean, it, to be able to set up on that and to get into a good position, create good tension, you're sliding all over the damn place. You can't do any leg driving. Mm -hmm. So, it's simple things like making sure you have traction down, making sure you have appropriate equipment, um, the setup process itself. What there's a lot of ways to approach it, and I'm I'm down for doing a lot of different ways as long as we're accomplishing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Whether you start toes back and then you arch into a setup and plant your traps, or you bridge off the bench and you push back, and that's how you get your scat positioning. Um, but as long as that process is there of all right, we're creating a good upper back pinch, all right, we're we're in a good position, we're up bridged up to our upper traps, uh, we get our feet into a comfortable position where you can create good leg drive, the unrack process, the racks at the appropriate height, um, you're keeping your lats engaged throughout that process. We're retracting, we're not pushing up. So these elements are usually the things that I feel people go awry in that make all the difference before you even worry about you know, where your touch point is or anything like that. Yeah. And kind of to go on that further, I'm glad you mentioned the setup because for me, that's kind of the biggest thing. Um, at least with my raw bench, the, the quick bench is still, there's a whole lot of things to unpack with that, but um, <laughs> changing my setup to, for me, um, I, I can get a, a solid arch for a 260 pound dude, but um, I feel like, when I really locked in, it was uh, actually Swede Burns set up video on Elite FTS that I kind of stole from and um, kind of went through that setup. And I focused more on trying to get it like a more thoracic extension vet rather than lumbar. And for me, that made the world of difference in terms of keeping my my back, like my scaps depressed and kind of onto my traps and keeping my elbow stacked. But um, it's almost kind of like benching to a, a one board now compared to what it used to be. And that's been the biggest thing for me because just if you were to watch like a max effort bench attempt for me before, as soon as I unracked it and started going down, you'd see me start deflating like a balloon. So I think, um, like you said, setup is definitely probably one of the most important things for bench in my opinion. Yeah. And, you know, you start talking a quick route. I mean, I'll go a step further and, how you with the timing of your breathing the duration you give yourself to actually accomplish that breath how you control reaching your upper abs and locking that in um, so the shirt's not pressing you down the positioning of the shirt there's so many more nuances equip side of things but um yeah that's that's big you know how i know i'm off when i when i'm benching in a shirt i know something's off when it feels like i just keep traveling a mile i'm like i swore i should have been touching by now that's when you know things are off. <laughs> yeah, so you mentioned kind of that the touch point, um, especially for bench. For for me, I kind of struggle to, um, I guess, inflate my stomach. I know, like at that kind of that last inch mark, you can almost 
some people can literally almost just reach to that point. Um, maybe what are some of the, the tips or some of the things that I could kind of keep in mind to get to there? Yeah. So when it comes to that aspect of, it, I think that's one of the biggest things uh, I tell people all the time. Like if I had to rebreathe under all that weight, it's, it's done. I mean, you might as well just re it. <laughs> I originally learned that from Vinny. Uh, Vinny Dizenzo would uh, would say, I remember being in line for weigh-ins that day. He did the 900, and I think he mentions maybe something along those lines of uh, we'll talk about the breathing. But, um, yeah, that's huge. So the, the big thing, like when I go up at these meets and I'll – so at USAPL, I don't get to choose my handoffs. There's no three-man handoff. I got to talk to this random dude behind the bar. So I go up to him and I tell him, you know, you count me three, two, one. And I'll start breathing off his three count because I think one thing that equip lifters get wrong is they rush their breathing. It takes time to inflate. You know, if I want to fully inflate and maximize that process, you know, it's going to be, you know, it's it's happening at three seconds. It's not just three, two, one, and now you're trying to quick breath. You're not getting much accomplished. So I will take that time needed to fully inflate, and I will set that reach with the upper abs. Like you're trying to drive your upper abs up towards the bar that needs to be set in before the bar comes out because if i don't even have that set in before the bar comes out if that's something i'm trying to get after the bar is already out then forget about it because that shirt's already locking me into where i where i am um so i guess those are the big the big things that hugely influence and i'll i'll realize when those are off um but you know, hopefully those help. <laughs> yeah. And then as far as, I guess, the actual movement itself, um, maybe obviously this is athlete dependent because different shoulder width, different arm length, all that thing. But um, I guess, generally speaking, what are some of the, um, not necessarily tools, but kind of things you see that helps you kind of figure out where their, their touch point might be, whether it's raw or in a shirt? Uh, to be honest with you, I just, I just kind of look at what looks anatomically good. In yeah. the bottom position, you know, whether if obviously if you're a closer grip venture, lower touch point, wider grip, wider touch point. Uh, if you're raw, I look more for elbows stacked over wrists. That's what I like to see is a good alignment. You know, if you're really wide max legal width, you don't quite have that alignment. But I mean, you can tell when someone is internally rotating at their shoulder and dumping forward and having a hard time pressing back versus being in a good position underneath. Um, and then in the shirt, it's going to look a bit different because you are going to have that aggressive overtuck, if you will, of the elbows. And I think that's an important process there. So that is going to look different. You would never want that position raw, but because of the tension of the shirt, it allows you to get into a different spot. But, um, you know, I don't know if I have a great answer for what I, what I look for, or tell people to do. I just tell them if I think they need to go a different direction by the eye test. <laughs> yeah. And I think it was kind of a, a trick question because, um, for, for me, that's something that it definitely takes. It's just something that you kind of get a, an acquired eye for, um, especially in a shirt where sm small tweaks can make literally a, a difference between 50 to a hundred pounds. And, um, so one of the things that Wait, I, hidden. yeah, <laughs> one of the things that I've been struggling with in the shirt is, um, kind of the, the, keeping the elbow stacked. And when I'm kind of going for that press, my elbows are shooting forward um, I don't know if that's something you see common, but what are some of the things that could be done to adjust to that? So, yeah, I'm actually working with a few lifters right now on that exact thing. So when you go to press, elbows kick in yep. and then you start traveling back. Yeah, so how I clean that up with my athletes is I'll do a lot of light technique work, even if it's a separate session. If it's mm -hmm. like another shirted session, but it's just like ridiculously lightweight. Um, hopefully you have like a lighter shirt that you can do this with or you're not moving anywhere, but um, it's getting the timing of the tuck down and then tucking more aggressively is what I find. So if you tuck aggressive enough to where you position you want to be in and need to be in, then you're going to be able to ride that tension right back out. You're not going to have the ability to kick in. So it's really just bringing that tuck further. So the, and, and that's the hard thing is actually executing that because if you're always sink or swim under heavy weight, you're not going to get that down. Yeah. That's something that you need to practice with light enough weight to really get a feel for what that position needs to be. Cause it's so vastly different than probably anything anyone's put themselves into. Uh, so that's where I find the key is it's just very awkward position. You're not going to get there trying to lift a shit ton of weight. Um, but that's exactly how you go about and fix that. 
Just, yeah. It's a more aggressive tuck, and then you just ride that tension out. And the other thing is how you control the bar path down. I think of it as you want to land an airplane uh, versus a helicopter, which is something I took from Rich Putnam. Okay. Uh, he's a great venture, yep. and um, yeah, he, he traveled down. He'll say spread, 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 and then you start tucking. So you're getting closer to the belly. Um, but the process is it, you're coming in on an angle versus just trying to drop straight down. So when you start that aggressive tuck near the bottom, that's when that uh, bar starts angling towards the peak of your belly. Shoot back from there. Yeah, and I think that kind of just almost gave me a, a, an aha moment because um, with the shirt, kind of where you go down is where you come up. And um, a big problem for me with that too is immediately pressing straight up. So that, that I like that kind of analogy of landing it like a plane. And um, you can touch on that a little bit more yeah i'm i'm so pumped for you because literally uh my uh my athlete Corey, that was his big struggle point we added like he just got into a quote and we started working together we added like a shit ton like 150 pounds of his bench or something that's what i um, said <laughs> yeah so what was going on he had to learn everything but he had it all down the positioning was good the descent was good for some reason though he was just the press was off um so he was, he was handcuffing himself in the body. He would press straight out. He wasn't riding that tension back. Mm -hmm. So that was, and once he did that, took off, took off. So it's getting there first off. So it's gradually working into that tuck position. Because if you tuck too soon and you pull it down, you locked yourself up. You're going to have to dump at the end. So it's gradually getting to that point, the timing of it. And then coming out of that, it's keeping that same tension outwards in the same fashion you came into it. And I tell you, once you get that down, I call it cutting through butter. It'll, you, you won't have a sticking point when you nail it. It'll just coast no matter how heavy it is. And then that's when you're going to lock 100 pounds right there. I'll tell you what. Good. Uh, that's what I hope for. Um, I think another thing I want to touch on, for, at least for something that I kind of noticed being a beginner in the shirt, is um, what exactly a tuck is. Um, when I, something that I kind of figured out halfway through. I haven't necessarily made the adjustment yet, but... Um, at first, I thought tuck was just literally bringing your elbows into your sides rather than almost pulling your elbows into your pockets. And I think that that's a huge difference of being able to um, not only keep that, that arch and that air in, but that, that touch point and try to find that, that tension. Yeah, uh, that's a great point because in this space that we're in, whether it's in person or online, so much gets lost in translation of the cues getting said uh what it means to one person is not what it means to the other so uh it, a lot just comes out of describing what that actually means like you just did there but what tucking means is it's not just like the repositioning of the elbows necessarily like you're talking about but i like to think of it you know the bend the bar cue is very applicable to um equip lifters yeah so you want to essentially bend the bar so much that you're driving your elbow forward near the bottom um it's not just hugging your side more that'll just create like a lower touch of anything it's it's literally putting your elbow like out in front of your wrist at times mm -hmm. that's that's pretty much what that is um so but yeah i mean with any cue it's what does it actually mean right yeah and then between single ply and multiply um obviously you've done both what are kind of some of the, the bigger differences in terms of uh, the technique of getting to that point? I always say if you can master single ply benching, you will be good off in any form of benching. Because the thing with single ply benching, you literally have, if you're tr trying to maximize what you can do, you have a single layer of material to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, you go to multiply, it just feels like you have so much more wiggle room to kind of make mistakes you have a lot of additional support uh, at least that was my experience you know the new i haven't worked too much in the f8 type shirts but you know i i damn know for sure if you can execute well in the single ply raw bench then you can work one of those as well once you get those nuances but single ply in, in my opinion hardest form of benching you can take lessons learned there to your raw benching because it just puts a huge highlight on everything that you actually need to do raw, that you're not actually feeling that it's off. Yeah. Uh, and then it sets you up for everything else you're going to do thereafter. That's why I love it. 
Um, I talked to Jimmy about this on occasion. I think he really loves doing some of that single ply benching as well because it really does carry over to everything. But um, that answer your question. I don't even know where we're going yeah, with that. No, and I guess off of that, um, <laughs> something that kind of comes up too with benching is the uh, your bubble. You have that that small window to where you have to be in that spot, or you're not. You're either gonna dump it, or it's just gonna go horrible. Um, so you would say that single ply probably has the, the smallest bubble out of any form. Yes, uh, the whole bubble analogy. I get it. I've never used it because still to this day, I can't resonate it. I don't know what the hell it means. I get the concept though. Um, but yeah, that's exactly right. You're, you're walking a thinner tight rope. Yeah. For sure. Well, um, I think I can kind of wrap things up here. So I'll ask you my final question. If you could um, give a word of advice to someone going into their first meet or trying to get into powerlifting, what would that be? I would say you are, uh, you are going to have a ton of doubt. Um, you're going to be like, am I actually ready? Am I strong enough? Uh, can I win versus my competition? You're going to have all these thoughts running around your mind. At the end of the day, you just, you got to do it. You got to sign up. If you can find help, that's excellent. Bring a friend, something, something's going to calm your nerves a bit, but you just, you got to do it. You got to do it. There's no getting to a certain point. People say all the time, uh, I want to have my total at this or that. So I'm competitive. You know, majority of time, you don't even know who you're going to compete with. Yeah. Like 100% of the time, you don't even know who you're <laughs> going to compete with. It would be a shame if you continue to delay things in an effort to be somewhere that you're never going to be because mm -hmm. you're always going to want to be stronger. And there's so many positives like we talked about initially. The friends you'll make, the experiences you'll have. So if you just continue to delay thing, you're missing out on all of that. So just do it. Yeah. Just sign up. It's like the old saying, the best day was yesterday. The second best day is today. Absolutely. I think the hardest thing for new lifters is actually finding where the hell the meets are. <laughs> because I remember back in the day, um, what was it? Powerlifting watch. I would go on there and list all the feds. Yeah. I, that, was, that, that was past my time. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. It's like nowadays – there's no universal website, at least that I know of, that there's like a thousand feds in the U.S. Like, what the hell is near my area? That's got to be the hardest thing, unless you know someone that's like, hey, there's a meet in the gym in town. For sure. Well, I wanted to thank you again for taking the time to come on. It was my pleasure. I really appreciate it. This was great. I enjoyed the chat. Awesome.